I'm Andrew Torgett with Texas History for Teachers, and we're in Goliad at Presidio La Bahia to give you a tour of one of the most iconic places of the Texas Revolution. Goliad was a place where about 400 Texas soldiers were executed on the orders of Santa Ana on March 27, 1836, just a few weeks after the fall of the Alamo. And it set off panic across Texas and opened the road for Santa Ana's armies to march into East Texas. So Goliad became a rallying cry for the Texas rebels for the rest of the war and a symbol of the sacrifice of the revolution. Goliad's role in the Texas Revolution goes back to the very beginning. When the first fighting broke out on October 2nd, 1835, with the Battle of Gonzales, some very similar fights also broke out in Goliad. In fact, some of Santa Ana's soldiers had been in Goliad back in September and taken over the Presidio and the town, leading to clashes with some local Texans. And when many of those soldiers then marched towards San Antonio, a group of Texans came together and attacked the few who remained on October 10th, 1835. The fight didn't last long, only about 30 minutes or so, and the Texans took over the town of Goliad for the rebellion. Now, why did they do this? Well, they did it because they believed that Goliad could be really important to the revolution. You see, Goliad was south of San Antonio, along the San Antonio River, and it was close to the coast. And because of that, the Texans believed that whoever controlled Goliad would also be able to control access to the Gulf of Mexico. So the Texans decided that they needed to take the town because if Texans could control Goliad, then they could prevent San Ana's troops from being reinforced or resupplied by sea. And so while fighting happened elsewhere, the Texans held on to Goliad for strategic reasons during the fall of 1835. Nothing much happened in the town during that time. There were no great fights or clashes. Most of the action was in San Antonio and in the Anglo colonies back east. Things heated up for Goliad during the spring of 1836. On February 12th, a man named James Fannin arrived in Goliad and became the commander of the Texas Volunteers holding the town. And Fannin moves his command into the old Spanish fort in town, Presidio La Bahia, which they renamed Fort Defiance to show Santa Ana that they were going to defy his centralist regime. What most people don't know is that Fannin did not plan to wait for Santa Ana to invade Texas. He'd arrived in Goliad because he planned to lead a Texas invasion of the town of Matamoros in northern Mexico. But as Fannin was preparing for this, he suddenly received word that Santa Ana had beat him to the punch and had entered Texas with his armies. And that changed things pretty dramatically. So Fannin decided to stay put in Goliad and build up the defenses of Fort Defiance to be ready for any attack that might come. And Fannin could not know it at first, but he had really good reasons to be worried about an attack on Goliad. When Santa Ana marched into Texas in early 1836, he had planned two lines of attack. Santa Ana himself would march his army to San Antonio, while he sent another one, this one commanded by a man named General Jose de Urea, that would go toward Goliad. The idea was that once both San Antonio and Goliad had been captured, then Santa Ana's armies would have a clear path to march eastward and put down the rest of the rebellion. So Fannin had his men put to work basically fortifying the Presidio. And they had a lot of work to do because the Spanish had built this place in the 1700s and by the 1830s they had pretty much a century of neglect and had to rebuild from there. So Fannin had his men rebuilding the walls and building them up as strong as well as they possibly could. And at the same time they're digging all of these ditches and throwing that dirt up against the walls in order to fortify them and make sure that they're strong enough to withstand a cannon attack. While all of that was going on, Santa Ana marched his army into San Antonio, arriving on February 23rd, and immediately surrounded the Alamo. For the defenders inside, and there were only about 200 people inside the Alamo, their only hope for survival was to get reinforcements. So the Alamo sent out riders in all directions asking for help. For the Alamo, Goliad seemed like their best hope, because they knew that Fannin had 300 men here and that they were only 95 miles away from San Antonio, which is only three days of hard marching. So the idea was for the Alamo, if they could hold out for a few days, it seemed like Fannin and the men here at Goliad could literally come riding to their rescue. So the commander of the Alamo, a guy named William Barrett Travis, sent a rider down to Goliad, who arrived on February 25th to ask for help. And Fannin reacted right away. He told all of his men, all 320 of them, to be ready to ride out the next morning at first light. They came out of these gates right here, heading down the road to San Antonio, but they only made it two miles, because when they hit the San Antonio River, everything started falling apart. 
First, the wagons broke down, probably because Fannin had insisted on hauling four cannons with him. Then the oxen, who were hauling the wagons, managed to get away. And so Fannin's men spent the rest of the day fixing the wagon and chasing the oxen. And so after spending a cold night along the river, Fannin decided to just give up and he called the whole thing off. He told his men to turn around and march the two miles back to Fort Defiance. The truth was his men were poorly supplied. Many didn't even have shoes, and it was unlikely that they could have made it to San Antonio, much less into the Alamo. All of Fannin's volunteers were deeply disappointed, though, and the whole mess made Fannin look really indecisive, and it made him increasingly unpopular with his own men. It also left the Alamo stranded. As the Alamo siege stretched on for nearly two weeks, the only reinforcements they ever got were 32 men from Gonzales. The Alamo never stopped asking Fannin to please, please send help, but Fannin decided he just couldn't do it. So instead, he simply had his men work on rebuilding the old Presidio. Meanwhile, Santa Ana's other army, under General Orea, was already in Texas and marching along the coast toward Goliad. As he got closer to Goliad, Orea attacked and defeated several small bands of Texans, and Fannin heard about these defeats. He knew that Orea was heading right for him, but he didn't do anything. He just waited. While Fannin waited, Santa Ana's troops stormed the Alamo and put all the defenders to death. So when Sam Houston got the news that the Alamo had fallen, he recognized that it was about as urgent a situation as Texas could face. And so he sent an immediate order down here to Goliad telling Fannin to retreat. What the actual order said was for Fannin to blow up Fort Defiance, retreat east toward Victoria so he could join up his forces with Sam Houston's and make for a much bigger Texas army. And it was about as urgent a moment as Texas could possibly face, but for some reason, Fannin decided not to retreat right away. And the question is, why? Why did he delay? Part of the reason is because he'd sent a, a number of his forces south of town to help civilians retreat. And so he wanted to wait for those guys to come back before he started his retreat. And he also kind of needed to wait because those guys had all the carts and the wagons that they would need. And so Fannin got the order to retreat on either March 13th or the 14th. And he waited. He waited through March 15th, the 16th, the 17th, the 18th, he waited until the 19th, five days after he got the original order before he started his retreat. That gave General Orea plenty of time to get to Goliad. It also gave Santa Ana time to send Orea extra reinforcements, 500 more soldiers that gave Orea 1,400 men in all. So Fannin and his men started their retreat at nine in the morning on March 19th, and they did it in the middle of an immense fog that really enveloped the entire Presidio complex. And they needed that because it provided them cover to get away. General Urea was in town not too far distant, and so they needed to basically sneak away. So they get out here on this road, which is the road that went out to Victoria, and they march down here all the way down that direction, going as fast as they possibly could, but they were hauling nine cannons with them and 500 spare muskets, so it was really slow going. And again, they had serious trouble at the San Antonio River. This time, one of the biggest cannons fell in, and they wasted an entire hour just fishing it out. Fannin made a fatal mistake during the retreat when he called a halt for his men in a big open field. And the reason he did it is he wanted to give his men a chance to rest, and he wanted to give the oxen that were hauling the wagons an opportunity to graze on some grass. But there's a problem. There ain't a big open field. And so as a result, they were really exposed to attack at any moment. And a lot of Fannin's men urged them to keep moving two miles further to Coletto Creek, where there were some trees where they could take shelter if they got attacked. But Fannin refused and they stopped right there. And so, of course, that was precisely the moment that Santa Ana's troops came riding up under the command of General Urea. And it was a terrible position for Fannin's men. They were caught out in the open prairie, pretty much the worst place they could possibly be. They tried to make a break for it, hoping to make it to the nearby woods for cover, but their overloaded wagon with all the cannons and muskets collapsed at that exact moment, which left them stuck in the wide open. So Orea's men came riding up and quickly surrounded the Texans. The Texans didn't have any choice but to fight it out right where they were. So they formed what's called a hollow square. They piled up their stuff on four sides, over here, over here, over here, 
and then over here. When they piled it all up, it provided them a little bit of cover to get behind to fire back at Araya's men. So for the whole afternoon of March 19th, Fannin's men fought against Araya in what became known as the Battle of Coletto Creek. And the Texans did pretty well, all things considered. Araya had his men charge at the Texans three separate times, and every time the Texans managed to fight them back. When night fell and it was too dark to shoot anymore, the Texans found they had lost 10 dead and 60 wounded, including Fannin. Araya's men had lost around 50 killed and 140 wounded. And they had survived the day, but things were bad. They were still surrounded, and the Texans had no food, no water, and they were running low on ammunition. So when it got light enough to see the next morning, the Texans saw that their position had actually gotten a lot worse. Araya had received reinforcements overnight, and now he had two cannons that were trained on the Texans. And so Fannin saw he basically had two choices. He could either surrender, or they could just die. So Fannin asked for surrender terms, and Araya told him that his only option was to surrender at discretion, which basically means you can surrender, but no promises we won't still kill you. And those are awful terms. They're the same ones that Santa Ana offered to the Alamo, but it seemed like the only possible option, and Fannin agreed to surrender. What's strange is that he told his men that their lives would be spared, and so it isn't clear if Fannin simply misunderstood the deal. So for the 230 Texans who could still walk after the battle, they were marched back to Goliad, where they were put into prison here in the church at the Presidio. And it took another three days to move all the wounded Texans from the battlefield back here, including James Fannin, who laid on the battlefield for two whole days before he was brought back to Goliad. And then there were another 80 Texans who were captured south of town, who were then brought up to Goliad, and they were put in here as well. So you had about 400 Texas soldiers crammed into this church, where it's their prison for an entire week while they wait to find out what their fate's going to be. While all of that was going on, Urea wrote to Santa Ana, telling him about the great victory and strongly recommending that Fannin's men be treated humanely as prisoners of war. But Santa Ana was having none of that. He called the Texans pirates, and he called them foreigners, and he ordered their immediate execution for waging war against Mexico. And this is how Santa Ana had treated the defenders of the Alamo, and he intended the same thing for the Goliad prisoners. Urea, for his part, though, wanted nothing to do with killing men who had already surrendered. So Santa Ana then sent a direct order to Colonel Jose Nicolas de la Portilla, who was now in command at Goliad, telling him to do it. Portilla received Santa Ana's letter on March 26th and, having no real choice in the matter, ordered that the prisoners be shot at dawn the following morning. At sunrise on March 27th, 1836, all the Texans who could still walk were formed into three groups, and they were marched out in three different directions under heavy guard. Now, the prisoners had been told a lot of things about where they were going. Some were told that they were going to gather firewood. Others were told that they were being marched to the coast to board ships that would take them to the United States. None of them knew what was coming. So when the Texans were ordered to halt, they stopped. And then the soldiers who were escorting them then turned and opened fire and killed almost all of them on the very first shot. For those who had survived that, those guys take off running across the field, trying to save their lives by getting to the nearby woods. Most of those guys got run down by men on horseback. And so in the end, there were 342 men who were killed that morning. There were a few survivors. Miraculously, 28 men actually managed to escape the firing squads and then got away by running as fast as they could into the nearby woods. Some of them later made it back to East Texas, and a few even ended up in Sam Houston's army at the Battle of San Jacinto. Another 20 Texans were spared by the Mexican army, some because they had important skills, such as doctors and interpreters. Some of them were spared because a Mexican woman with Urea's army named Francita Alvarez apparently did everything she could to save the lives of some of the Texas prisoners. We don't know too much about her, but she has since become known as the Angel of Goliath. After the massacres, there were still 40 wounded Texans back at the Presidio. 
and they were all quickly shot, bringing the number of dead close to 400. Finally, it was time for Fannin, who was one of the very last. They blindfolded him, sat him in a chair, and shot him. Santa Ana's men then burned all the bodies, stacking them in piles where they had fallen. And this was the same thing that happened to the Alamo defenders, as Santa Ana denied them even a decent burial. News about the Goliad massacre spread quickly throughout the rest of Texas. When Texans learned that the Alamo had fallen and all the defenders had been killed, and then that all of Fannin's men had been captured and summarily executed, panic spread across Texas homes and farms. People feared that Santa Ana would kill them too if he found them, and that's precisely what Santa Ana hoped his killing of everyone at Goliad would do, scare Texans into giving up the rebellion. And thousands did abandon their homes and run toward the United States in what became known as the Runaway Scrape. But the Goliad Massacre had another effect that Santa Ana did not anticipate. It became a rallying cry for the Texas Army that Sam Houston was building. And so, when the fateful final battle came at San Jacinto on April 21st, 1836, the Texas soldiers who overran Santa Ana and his army were shouting not just remember the Alamo, but also remember Goliad. In fact, a few of the men shouting remember Goliad in Sam Houston's army were actual survivors of the Goliad Massacre. The remains of the Goliad massacre victims remained unburied until June of 1836, when a man named Thomas J. Rusk and a group of Texas soldiers came running through Goliad, and they gathered up all the remains and brought them here, where they buried them with full military honors. And then there was really nothing to mark this spot except for a giant pile of rocks until 1936, fully 100 years later, when the state of Texas decided to build this memorial which was dedicated on June 4th, 1938, to the memory of the Goliad Massacre victims.